he firstly says the main event today uh, is Damien Show. You know, mm -hmm. the the uh, really played this uh, beautiful show again put together for us. We had time, some time, we might talk a little bit about Piper and text in general related to his work. Um, uh, but of course, I, I'm deeply indebted to James uh, coming all the way from Waterford today to conduct another conversation uh, with Damien on specific kind of parameters that they've set themselves. So I think it's a very interesting uh, conversation. James, a, a lecturer in fine art, um, teaching also in Trinity in the course of psychoanalysis, um, and of course, founder of and main sole subscriber or, or writer uh, uh, for the Billion Journal. That I'm sure you're all aware of. That's a fantastic um, uh, online fine art journal. Uh, maybe not quite dedicated to bit of painting, but it's it, for his views on painting and on contemporary art. It's, it's a must read. Uh, thank you very much, James, for coming up today, and Damien for doing the talk, doing the show, making the show happen, and uh, uh, under tight time constraints, maybe. But best way to uh, do it. It's, it it came together uh, amazingly, so I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, I think it'd be good to give a bit of a backstory to this, in a way. Um, I know Damien for years. Um, <laughs> we met in Dunleary. I was a painter, and he was a painter. He was a year ahead of me in Dunleary. And we just kind of struck up a conversation in the studio. And uh, all I wanted to be was a painter um, at this point. Um, but things kind of changed along the way, uh, and I got directed in different, uh, different paths, uh, criticism and just art, other types of art. But um, uh, I've always kind of admired um, painters, in a sense, for continuing to paint. Uh, I also have a fast, I still have a fascination with painters and um, I think it's a very different type of medium than the other media um, out there um, it is something uh, I was watching this uh, Werner Herzog uh, documentary recently uh, called Into the Inferno and there's these, there's these short clips of um, Katie and Morris Kraft they're Vulcan volcanologists and um, it shows this kind of, it shows this moving lava behind um, there were these people, these two French volcanologists that went up very close to volcanoes and uh, the clips of them in the 1970s shows this lava kind of going behind them it's so kind of meaty and so monstrous that it kind of reminded me of painting this kind of they also, they also consumed them Yeah, they also <laughs> consumed them in the area <laughs> But, too close to a volcano. but there, was something, there was something about it that, in a way, related me back to painting and what it is, and this idea of the idea and the research that goes behind painting, and then that, that moment of instinct mm. that takes over. Uh, and what is that? And what is painting? Uh, and all these questions. So, um, this, is our, this is probably our, like a third public discussion around painting. And we're always trying to make it as informal as possible so we can actually discover things ourselves. Um, I don't have questions here, I have words. Uh, <laughs> I always start with words um, because having questions is just, you know, yeah. pointless. So, um, what I got excited, I've only saw the show today, it's been on for a month or so, and I got really excited earlier. Um, and one of my first words was medium, the painting medium. And uh, I saw a bit of kind of, uh, there was a bit of Madder Lake on mix mm. on, the, on that painting to the left there, and uh, Damien had just put it down uh, on mix. And I, and I asked him, like, oh, so why did you do that? What was the intention behind that, uh, that mark? Mm. And what, how did you get that place where you picked Madder Lake to put down there uh, so, so wrongly? So yeah. we maybe start there at the medium. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think kind of that. That decision to put um, the colour matter light, I mean, there's twofold on that. I mean, the first part is that it, it comes from the painting parting, which is on the wall over there, which is the kind of grey slab, and this uh, raw matter light pushed into the canvas. And it, you know, there's that thing where I actually painted the, the grey down and kind of put the little gradient in the bottom. And I bought the matter light, 
for, for a reason that it is just, you know, it's just a, a alizarin crimson, but it, there's kind of a slight difference to it, and it, it, there is something quite, um, you know, I guess, inside knowledge painting about Matter Lake. I mean, it just, you kind of see it come up in different conversations and kind of different um, sort of areas of paint. So, um, and there's also a connection to sort of Renaissance and Baroque art with alizarin crimson, like it's a very royal colour. And you know, it's a very meaty, uh, blood colour, like, so it's, it's like just a, so sort of, uh, sort of, I don't know, um, almost a celebration of paint just being able to just push that into the canvas and, and not mix it. You know, like, like when I'm teaching painting, like I'm always like the golden rule is mix out all your colours, don't just take them straight out of your tube. So it's kind of nice when you get to that stage in your life and you're going to go, no, I'm allowed to now, I can just take it straight out. But um, there's, to get back to kind of where to mark on that, like why the decision was made, that comes down to that area of instinct where, you know, I'd taken the canvas back out and that canvas was started at the beginning of the kind of maybe three, four month period of making. So it was one of the first to be started. But it was one of these, like on those raw canvas ones, there's such slow paintings with every single mark that goes down is recorded. You cannot undo it, like, it just, it's there forever. Like, it just, it's just such an absorbent surface. So, you know, when I took it out of the actual storage and started looking at it again, it just felt that there needed to be something there that was reactionary and kind of kind of creating, you know, an activation of the canvas. So, yeah, I mean, the, the first thing was just to kind of carry on this matter like uh, element that runs through, like, a good view of the canvas and you see it cropping up. And it is just that thing of, of like, I think a lot of painters do, where you just they'll actually grab the tube of paint and, and, and paint with the tube of paint. So it's quite, you know, it's quite a nice, sort of a um, direct way of doing it. and it's also it's clumsy like it's a clumsy way to work which is i think just something quite nice about that of actually just using a tube of paint to paint with. it's like using your fingers there's a you know you can't finesse it you can't do what you normally do with a brush where you know i'd know your brush is too well at this stage so you kind of you're very you know crafty with what you're doing when you, when you apply paint with a brush you, you've got such control over but a tube of paint it's it's awkward it's it's clumsy you suggested there that like only painters would know this no this idea about matter lake and uh, the use of matter lake. I would assume uh, so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you <laughs> thought like I, I like someone said to me recently he was a painter and he said that um, yeah when he wrote it in an interview that and um, painting is only for the painters. Mm. In, like you said in a very general sense, but like are you painting for the painters as well, doing those little things? Um, I think, no, I, I, like, so, you know, to be completely honest, this show wasn't made with any um, audience in mind. Like, and, and like, I, you know, I'd be quite a selfish painter, and I do paint for my own amusement and my own kind of like, like competing against myself, kind of push it that bit further. Or, you know, you 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 just that hope in your mind that like it connects to other people, or they can get as excited about about as you do. But. I think every painter knows that you know the only person that spends that amount of time with their paintings is them. You know, most people. What is it? The average is like in five seconds. People engage with art for and move on. So, you know, I don't think anybody is going to be looking at you know one of my paintings for like three months. So, yeah. so there is that kind of thing. Of, do I make the work with an audience in mind? This show definitely not. The last show in, in the lexicon. I mean was completely made with an audience in mind and I found that quite crippling and a very tough constraint. So um, you know the matter like thing and um, again it is kind of you know that is one of those things that you would know that you know it's probably an inside joke for myself <laughs> it's the name of it you know but, uh, yeah. um, it, Jerome suggested at the beginning that this was just a time limit on this show you did mm. the paintings in a very short amount of time they're big paintings mm. Um, and I think this conversation came out of uh, the notion of research versus yeah. instinct. And your lexicon show in Dunleary was very much about research. Yeah. Um, like it was very heavily, you know, researched and very yeah. intensely. So. But I put it to you before that, like, this show wouldn't have come out, this instinctual show wouldn't have co come about unless you went through the kind of rigor of research that you did over those months, over, the, over that year, the yeah. Dunleary show. Do you think that's the case? Do you think this is a kind of resi a kind of a reaction to that Dunleary show? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think there's a, there's a reaction um, in the sense that, 
the Dunleary show was tied to kind of maybe, you know, a group of, of 30 people that I interviewed. And there was this, um, you know, very intense sort of feeling that you had to do right by them. You know, that you know, there, there had to be a real definite maybe connection to it. Now, I don't know if the show has that in the end. I mean, that's very hard for me to say, but, um, you know, it just felt that I was very aware of the audience being part of the research and the further audience that would be attracted to the next economy to come to it. There's kind of, um, there's this safety when you're in a, in your, a gallery space that you, you're, you're expected to make kind of, I think, tough art, like art that is harder to get. Like you're, I think there's a more of a thing that when I step into a gallery, like I want to be challenged. I don't want to go in and just go, oh yeah, walk back out. You do want that, you know, resistance that you have to try and push yourself a bit to it. So I think there was that reaction when I finished the Lexicon show that I could just delve into all these areas that maybe I couldn't have done in the Lexicon. So you know, there was just a strength with the, the Lexicon show of trying to make that a little bit more readable, where this show I could just go all out and kind of delve into these areas and, and make the language a little bit more complicated. And, you know, yeah, I think you, you kind of feel secure in, in, in the kind of gallery environment. Are you happy with the show? Yeah, no, the dick isn't it? It's terrible. Yeah, no, well, that's a bad thing, isn't it? Um, I wouldn't have thought so, no. I don't, don't believe by that stuff. Because like, uh, I'll get bored by it you know, in, in a couple of weeks. Like, <laughs> I don't want to just do it all again. So I've already got like the, the new stretchers lined up in the studio. So, you know, just, for me, it's kind of... Like, I, I was happy to an extent that I could show where there was something niggling at me. So, um, you know, where, where, where the work goes next, I, I have no idea. And I'm sure there's going to be a few months of, of, of absolute um, torture and terrible work. But, you know, that's just how it goes. So you admit <laughs> that you make terrible work at times. Loads, yeah. yeah, yeah. Times, yeah. Does that make it out to the public? <laughs> right. so. I well, actually destroy them now. I never used to. I used to paint over them. And now I just take a knife to them. The second I get unhappy with them, they're just torn up. And, and there's a lot of very full bins up in my house at the moment, so <laughs> it's like, even this show, like, there's, um, I think there was kind of four or five works that were actually, you know, halfway through, and I think in my mind, I did a very definite thing with these works, that they had to have this um, level of refinement, and, you know, space in them, so with this type of work, every mark you put down, you're limiting that space, so every time you keep on adding another mark, you know, the success rate starts to drop further. So there would be this kind of cut-off point where <coughs> certain things would happen and it would, it would just be like, okay, this work has to be destroyed now because it, it can't, it's never going to be able to compete with the other works. So. And you did, the Lexicon show had a, a much higher rate of destruction. I think there was, you know, maybe, I think 16 works made for that show at the beginning that were just all destroyed. And that was, you know, was the first half of the show that I made and I just was so unhappy with it that you know, I could destroy them. But, you know, I have the freedom to destroy work now, where if I went back, say, to my first show at the gallery, or even my second show, and even the third show at the gallery, like, all those shows, I was, like, would have had such a tight budget. I would have 15 canvases and, you know, needed to make 15 works, so you had to make those, like, paintings work. So, kind of, um, I guess the con con confinements at that time would make, mean that I would keep on painting over the canvas, because I, I honestly couldn't afford to buy more paint or can you know, what not more paint more canvas, so you had to kind of work with it. I mean this time you know there was that nice bit of luxury there where you could just move on to a new canvas or which is um, yeah it's kind of it's a very nice place to be when you make them work. I'm just trying to think like I I've been reading uh, Henry Miller this week. I put his book off for ages this uh, Tropic of Cancer in Rose. I recommend mm -hmm. recommend it's one of my favourite book. books. <laughs> But he talks about this period that, you know, he was a literary man that um, he was referencing other people all the time. Mm. And uh, he, he, there was other voices in his writing, I suppose. And about three years ago, I think I went into your studio in Boston. Was it three years ago? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, about two and a half. Yeah. yeah. And um, you had changed dramatically. I don't know what it was. And you're talking about this these moments in time where, mm. you know, you had the money to, you, had, yeah, you didn't have the money and then you did have the money yeah. to maybe do it. And then, um, but I did, something had dramatically changed, either it was the studio change or something like that. Yeah. It was moving from Temple Bar to Grosso. And what you had started doing was these kind of um, 
It was mark making, really. Yeah. It was just it was these kind of lines. They were kind of punctuation marks. Yeah. They were just very minimal. And it, and before that, there was always a kind of a sense of struggle in your work. In that, but I found always found the struggle interesting because mm. the work was very challenging, and they were kind of slow burner paintings mm. that you kind of had to stay with until they unlocked yeah. in some way. And um, I'm just trying to think that what happened. What happened at that time in Brussels that you start doing these kind of minimal? Well, I think um, I mean, two things happened. Um, time evaporated. <coughs> that was one thing. So I remember at that time that the changeover, I did the third show coming up here, and there was like maybe four months before the show opened, and I had to move studio from uh, Temple Bar. And I don't know, to be honest, like Temple Bar is an amazing space, but I always found it difficult to work there. There was just unusual pressure with that place, and it might have been that you know you felt that you were you know, lucky to be there and that you have to use the time correctly and that, that for me kind of didn't seem to work that well but when I moved to Broadstone there was just a, a nicer vibe there, like I just felt at home, it was really comfortable, it was, you know, it was, it wasn't that pressure, it was very much, you know, people coming and going, it was just a really nice space to be, I can't explain it. And I, I remember like first seeing the studio there and going, oh god, I'll make it work, you know, because they're unusual spaces but the work just happened there, it was like, it was a really, really nice place to be. And, you know, but the, I guess the show coming up here was, it was coming up so fast and there was this element of absolutely no time to make the work. So, yeah, I think it kind of worked for me. I think the, the, the seeds of this work were planted in that, for, in that show and in, in being in Broadstone. And I think the further thing that happened was then researching in Dubai, like actually going to Dubai for, for two weeks and then coming back and again having to make a show in ridiculous short period, I think it was two months. I, I thought I had three months, which is like, I can do that. And then I was talking to the gallery and they were like, no, no, it takes a month to ship it. <laughs> and suddenly I was like, holy crap, you have to make the work, you know, let it dry. Like on these works, um, you know, they're quite delicate. I mean, like they're, the surfaces on them, they, they mark and scratch quite easily. So, and they have to dry fully before they can move. I remember with the work before, you could spill a cup of coffee on them and you wouldn't know. Like, <laughs> it's just like, there's so much mess on them that, you know, there'd be often times where work would get damaged and just whack another bit of paint on it because you're so heavily layered. This work, you couldn't do that. Like, every single mark is, is there and, and to be read. You know, I mean, the, the making of these paintings is, is in front of you. There's nothing kind of hidden. And um, so, you know, the, the, that time constraint I mean, actually works for me really well. I think if I have too much time, I think I overwork stuff and overthink stuff. And that goes back to kind of stuff that I'm quite interested in is just this intuition and this, you know, subconscious of making work where you get into a sort of a zone and things just start to happen and you're not overly thinking it, you're just letting the work come out. But that's where I'm trying to go. I didn't finish that talk about uh, Henry Miller in that he, at the beginning when he was a young man, he was a literary man, so he referenced other people, he had footnotes. But then all of a sudden he came to this point where he got rid of all that and, and yeah. he felt that he was speaking through his own voice or he, he got to these kind of points of thinking that he felt someone was, was dictating through him yeah. that he, and he was able to type really fast. Mm -hmm. So his technique on the typewriter was perfect. So at points he felt this voice was overtaking him mm -hmm. and it wasn't the voices of the past, it was something else. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, where I'm going with this is that kind of, does, do context shape painters? or artists in general, that context and everything has to be right and um, the timing has to be right. All this information yeah. has to be right that you've gathered since you were a student in art college has to be right for this, these things to click. But you feel the freedom to do what you're doing Yeah, now. I think time is a big one. Yeah. Time is a huge thing. I was talking to some students there and the other day and I, I was saying that like over a period of time you just, you, you uninstitutionalize yourself. Like, cause I think no one can deny that when you've done, you know, whatever, six years of college, you're institutionalized, how you write your statement is, is very similar to other people, how you operate your studio is very similar, like everybody has this kind of similarity to it and it just takes time, I think, to start unlearning and finding your own voice and your own language and, and this confidence and freedom to actually embrace what you want to do and start let, letting go of, of these, um, you know, handed down things. I'm not, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with, with that institutionalized stuff. I mean, that's how, like, that's how I learned, you know, I mean, I probably wouldn't change any of it, but I think you, you get to a point where you realize that that was the learning 
negative to do the doing and, and there's this freedom I think when you get to that stage of actually letting go of a lot of that stuff and, and kind of just making the work you want to make. And I think it is it is what you're saying about that like stopping referencing. Like I don't have any research material in the studio, there's no photographs, no notes, no anything and it's purely just painting in there and I, it's the nicest way to work. You come in and it's like it's just your own voice. Like it's <laughs> so when you think about it it's so kind of egotistical in the way the studio space, it's just it's all about you and creating and I, and I, talk, I was talking to a uh, curator and just the other day and she was asking me like, so you know how do you how do you make these works like what, what why do you set it up and just the strangest talk popped into my head and it sounds, it sounds terrible when you say it out loud it's good you create a safe space <laughs> it sounds so bad it? you create this like safe space to make work where you have that freedom to completely um, like make a mess and, and explore and, and let things happen and, and I think that that's another thing. I remember when I was in Temple Bar, I had this feeling that, you know, even when I made a bad work, it was like, I had this like pressure of that this could be suddenly seen. You know, like someone could come into the studio and, and see it or, or, you know, because there's a lot of activity. One of the amazing things about that place was there was a lot of curators coming through, there was a lot of gallerists around. So you would kind of have these chance meetings. And I always had this horrible pressure when there's a really like shit work on the wall. I'd just be like, oh my God, like I got rid of this soon. Like there's the evidence. <laughs> I'll never forget, like, um, there was a, a gallerist over from New York and he was so boisterous and like, oh my god, yes, running around the studio looking at stuff and he started pulling stuff out that I'd hidden. I was just absolutely mortified. I was like, that's a steaming pile of shit you're looking at. And I know it is, but you're going to remember that now. And then, um, you know, and I remember an artist saying that to me before. He was like, yeah, yeah, there's bad work in your studio. Just get rid of it if you know you have a studio visit because you will come across these characters. and." And now I just, you know, I just don't think twice, destroy, just get rid of it. <laughs> but also my studio is in brain now, so no one comes out there. So it's, it's, it is that completely safe space, like, you know, I'll know when someone's coming. You know what I mean? And I can easily hide stuff or destroy it. So there is that security with it, like, I think that's kind of... Random. How do you know it's good or bad? Because I went into your studio sometimes, I picked out a painting that you didn't like. Mm. I know, it is, I mean, it's, was it someone else said to me there, and just the other week, they were saying, you know, you know, do artists, are, 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 are artists allowed to say this is a good painting or a bad painting or a good piece of art or a bad piece of art? And then, I don't know, I think it's part of it. I think it's, you know, if, if I destroy, you know, a really good work, so be it. That's just part of my makeup as who I am. And I think, you know, yeah, I think you, it's like, it's like um, I think if you go to um, a BA studio, of painters and they have each say 25 works out. I mean you could essentially cur curate, you know, nothing but great shows there. I mean because I guarantee you they have five really really good works there that you could just exhibit those works and show a good show. But if the student doesn't know why those works are shown or what is in them, well then, you know, they're not a good artist. Or you know, well, you're not yet anyway. I mean it's all learning. I mean, you know, you know, editing is a huge part of, of, of kind of making and um, I think you're only as good as the editor you are, so, um, and that's something that, you know, I struggle with a lot, um, you know, it's just can you, have too, can you have too much time with the work? Because this show is done very quickly and it feels, the work does feel like it's done. I think, I think it depends on the artist. I mean, I know some artists that would, would, you know, they'd have a show and they'd be exhibiting works from 2014, but in their head they're brand new and they've needed those, you know, few years to actually sit with them and I, I really admire that I think it's an amazing way to be I just have like you know attention deficit disorder so I couldn't do that like I'd be like I think about too much time I just they'll become boring to me and you know um, I'll destroy them so for me yes speed is brilliant it's like just keep keep moving and, and moving on but, um, but I have had works that you know I've struggled with at the time and let sit for you know maybe a year or something and come back to and they've worked for me then and, I think sometimes you create a work that is, is ahead of your thinking, that you're not there yet and, and the work has, has arrived, so you kind of need to um, give it time and catch up with it. So there is, it can be risky. And you said though, do you know, like, do you know instinctually that that work that you think that has, um, that you're behind it in some mm. way, do you set that aside or do you yeah, think no, that? Yeah, I think you do, no, 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 you do, you do sense about it. I think, um, 
it's very rare in it. I don't think I've ever destroyed a work that had some potential in it. Like if there's a, you know, a glimmer of hope, I usually hang on to it. But what I mean now is that if something starts to become too heavily layered, like I'll just destroy it because it just drives me mad. Like it just irritates me so. Um, yeah, that could change. And next year I'm going to be making heavily layered paintings again. I, I don't know at the moment. And I'm way more excited about kind of reducing down the language, but just kind of creating these um, smaller pockets of painting within the paintings. Like you see, you're seeing some of the paintings there is these little flourishes of painting, and that's kind of that's where it's alive for me is making these little moments rather than big, big huge gestures. I think there's, there's little moments in these large canvases. Like the luxury here is that we have you, there's two shows you, that you've had this year, one that was heavily researched and one that's much more reactionary. Mm. Like what is the best way for you to work in a way, you know? Like, do, do you look back on the show in Dunleary as being good in relation to this or bad in relation to this? Um, I sit uneasily with the show from Dunleary, if I'm completely honest. I'm, I haven't made a decision on it yet. Like um, I, some of the works I really like in it. Um, as a whole body of work, it sits uneasily with me. I don't know what it is. And what about the time? When, you, when it was up showing, what did you feel about the work? Did, were you embarrassed by it? Were you fearful? No, no, no. But I kind of was um, <coughs> definitely not embarrassed or anything like that. I was more um, curious about it. I think I was so scarred from the process that I couldn't actually see the work. I was just, it was such an undertaking. Like, I like, you know, barely what, six, seven months to kind of. Um, conduct all these uh, interviews and produce a body of work and, and it was just mind melting work and I remember actually us talking I would have been about halfway through the, the making of the show and you were asking me and you know, is there a struggle in the work and I think I was like oh no not at all and I think I was so scarred in my head that I just kind of went into this kind of strange place where I was like everything's fine everything's okay but it was just absolute mental torture like it was just such a balancing act I think if I had had a year or two years you know I could have let it flow a bit more but it was so intense that there wasn't that um, sort of space to kind of um, to think about it so is there a push to kind of frame painting within ideas within words absolutely yeah. and like because this this show here doesn't really have a, con a concept as such but you, there is a lot of text behind it as well. There's a, kind of quite a lot of text. And we're having a talk here, which yeah. is another form of... Well, I mean, there's, there's, there's a descriptive text more so um, mm. for this show than anything else. And I, I kind of I wanted to do that. I, didn't, like, I mean, there's a, there's a, a slight framing. Um, there's a little bit of text for it that just frames the show. And uh, it's just a story about belief and, and ideas and kind of what, mm. how we see the world. And that's just, you know, that's more so a framing of my practice in general than this show like that that framing could be put on everything that I've done so and that's you know more so the way I, I want to I guess move the work at the moment where like before I've, I've, I've researched quite specifically and made it a show that is very very specific to a context and I think I've slowly been moving away from that and and you know I, th I think the Dunleary show would have been made I don't know if it's the last time I would do something like that but at the moment I, I don't want to step back into that arena for a good while so I think traveling is a nice way to do it just experiencing different places because for me that informs the practice more so than anything I mean going to, the, going to Dubai and physically going to a place was, was the, the nicest way to research it felt right for a painting for what I do just to go physically to a place and experience it rather than you know conduct interviews or, or, or read tons of books it felt more so connected to the medium in this kind of emotional way or in this intense way in this kind of physicalness i mean because painting is you know there's a, there's a physicality to painting there's a weight to it there's like you know photographs can never do a painting justice like actually going to see it is the only way to experience it so much like a space much like a place much like a country the only way to experience it is to go to it you know i mean i'll never forget the smells that, that i smelt over over in dubai you know, painting for me is the same way, you know, you go to a, a good painting show and you can smell it, like it's, it's in the air. Like, and you know, sometimes, especially, you know, when the paintings are only a couple of weeks old, like, they're, they're very much still alive, like, the, the, the paint is still moving. Like, I was trying to photograph, and the last painting that was made for the show was parking, and I was documenting the work, and I was just like, that isn't dry enough to be photographed yet. And 
and paint has that beautiful thing where it settles over, you know, a month or two months and then it can be photographed and settled down. You, yeah, you come alive when you're talking about, uh, talking about the material of paint. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, do you come to other paintings or other painters and judge them in relation to the method and how they apply paint and how they put paint down rather than the idea? Do you come to paintings like to other painters in that? Like, what way do you come to it? Do you read the press release? Do you care about your press release? Is it all about the mm -hmm. painters? Yeah, and um, that's an interesting question. Um, I have a, I have a a process when I go to see a, a show, um, any show, but specifically painting, where I, I won't pick up the press release at the beginning. I'll, I'll go just look at the work, and if it, if it catches me, then I'll go pick up the press release to read the titles. And if you know, if the interest grows, then I'll, I'll bring, I'll read the press release. So there's kind of this three-tiered system to it. But um, I guess I would, without realizing it, I'd definitely come in. And just, I just want to experience them first, and and that maybe sums up kind of painting for me is that is that experience of seeing them being with them um, yeah I think when I go see painting shows it is that I go in and just experience them and, and spend some time and, and, and see what starts to come out and it is yeah you know like, I kind of be one of those paint sniffers that I'd be like right up you know I think every time I'm in the National Gallery I always set off that wire <laughs> I think you're like because eh. I'm always like right up with them like trying to you know like dipping your head into the light and seeing how the light hits them and I'll be like that any painting show I go see I'll always look at the edges and you know like all those little things matter, like how a brush hits the canvas or, you know, how the edge is treated, like do you see finger marks on it, won't you, you know, what decisions have the painter made and I think they're all valid and, and they all add up to the actual work. Mm. Talk about getting up close, I saw a fleck of primer on one of the paintings in here, it was like a small bit and it was like you were being priming another canvas mm. and this tiny bit of primer hit one of the finished paintings. Mm. Is did, have you seen that? And is that okay if that's there? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we just have the second one up there. Yeah, I think it's a piece of dirt. <laughs> oh, I think it needs to be brushed off. I think that is primer. Okay, I bet it's primer. Um, <laughs> we have a bed on. I guess you go up to it after, and I get the bed to go wipe off. Um, <laughs> it does. Does it, like just say it's primer. Yeah. yeah. Um, does that matter? Um, it depends, because like, usually, like, you know, I would, like, um, I wouldn't, I never prime canvases in white, so mm. that's why I know it can't be prime. Okay, so, um, okay. Oh, yes. You know, uh, unless it's, you know, it happened mm. when I was touching the walls or something, which could have been but, um, you know, generally, like, when, like, say, if I'm, I'm kind of painting the large works and it's kind of the big stab of grey or something, like, paint sometimes does fly off and, and hit other canvases, and there is that moment where you look at it again. You know, it depends if it's um, depending on the surface you have, like maybe you know, five minutes to, to wipe it back and, and you should survive. But some of these surfaces it doesn't, and, and mm -hmm. I know there's um, like one or two canvases where paint did hit it, and suddenly I was just like, okay, mm -hmm. something new has to go in there. And <laughs> you just, yeah, but I, I like that element of chance, like some interesting things have happened then. You know, again on that painting parting there's a little um, there's a little nub that looks like a sticky out belly button on the bottom left corner. And that happened because there was just I don't know how it happened, I think um, I was moving a canvas and I clipped it and kind of just created a smudgy dirt mark and it's something like So but like just the shape of the mark was just kind of interesting. So I just got a bit of ink paint on my thumb and just pulled it out and then made the shadow mimic and that element of chance and play, I think, can be quite interesting because it brings in something different than you would intentionally do. But again, this is just reacting to what is happening on, on the canvas, and that's how I paint. Like I'll put down a line, and then how that line reads off something else will be how the painting progresses. So, so I kind of I think there's a freedom in it. There's not. A, I wouldn't be precious about it. Like if I just never anything happened in, in the studio that has destroyed a work. Like it's usually just a bit of a spanner in the works that you're like, okay, how do we move on from this? Because until they're up on the wall in a gallery, for me, you know, they're, they don't fully exist. They're, you know, they're still in motion until they leave the studio. So you have to, that's when they're definitely 100% finished because up until that point you can tinker away and keep on, you know, pulling at it. Mm -hmm. Um, you spoke about this idea of the experience, just, you know, because we're dealing with objects here and in a way, you know, painting is, you know, if we think in, in like in a kind of cynical way, painting is the like art object par excellence in, in that mm -hmm. it's something that people want to own. 
yeah. is something that they separate. Someone, a collector will come in, in here and buy one and they'll separate it from the setting, from all the yeah. other the experiences that it works. And in a way it collapses the whole, this whole idea of experiencing art in a kind of setting of objects, yeah. you know. And like I see these as a, as a suite, as a, as a body yeah. of work, and that one only works against the other one. They're not actually, in some ways they're not working individually, they're working off each other. Yeah. And the residue of the one that you came in at the beginning, you saw at the door, is with, still with you when you mm -hmm. come to the one. At the, you know, so you're kind of bouncing all the time. Yeah. So how do you feel about that? Because like, there is, you know, you're doing these works in a studio, a very small studio, not much perspective within the yeah, studio, yeah. even to paint them. They're huge works. I think this, in this, in this way, I think they're the most <coughs> experiential works that mm. you've painted, because they're the biggest works you've painted so far. Yeah, I mean, that's why a few people have made it, these spaces for you to actually almost physically, you know, you could fit a body into them. Yeah, yeah. these spaces within them, yeah. that was quite interesting. Yeah, and they're very kind of human, they're at that human size. I was even, I'm standing here, and I was kind of like, I was jumping up yeah. against that one because I was kind of the same height as me. I thought it was the same height. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, there's something, but there is that there is that thing though. I mean, like what you said, they're making them in the studio and it's in, in the space. And so I remember, and I would have been about three quarters of the way through making the work, and I had this um, slight panic attack. I was just like, "Do these works work with each other?" I had no idea. I, I could see two of them together, but as you're saying, I couldn't get back from them. And, I remember like taking photos on my phone and just putting them on the computer and trying to lay them out and just, just see do they communicate with each other because it was this um, uncertainty that I had and I was very worried like I was like having these sort of uh, like visions of the works being in the space and, and, and clashing and uh, you know attacking each other and but I remember uh, just putting them on the computer and thinking, no but there is there's a language and there, there's a balance and they were sort of working um, to, to a certain degree so but for me, to, to go back to the question of this experiential thing, or you know, breaking them apart, I'd see a, a show as a very separate thing to paintings by themselves. You know, what I mean, like I, I, I set up a show that it is an experience, and that you go experience that for the period of time that it's on. But I think you can experience painting separately, very differently. Like I, I think these paintings, if you were to come in here and there's only one, you would experience that solely by itself, and I think it would mean something very different. So. I don't have an issue with them, you know, I think the paintings are strong enough by themselves to, to live on. I mean, they were made individually. You know, there's only the first two that you see up there when you come in on the right, they were made together. And they're the only two paintings that were made with an intention that they would communicate deliberately, where these works were made solely as kind of, you know, whatever was happening on the canvas. There was kind of, I guess, you know, intentional things like to bring it back to the Matter Lake, where, you know, there was this kind of, um, palette that I was like okay well I want to try and bring that fleck through and that's something that's true of the, of the show in Dubai where there was this kind of fiery red blob that kind of traveled through a lot of them and I remember there was a, an art writer looking at the show and he was like just what's it, following it so they would just pop into the edge of some canvases and come into another one I quite like that narrative element so there is slight little narrative things that will, will kind of just pull, pull the canvases together and, and hopefully not let them pull apart too much. There is a fight here in these canvases, kind of though, between this narrative representations mm -hmm. of half a jug over there. Mm -hmm. But the kind of the representation kind of is quite ephemeral, and you would think that like the representation would kind of you know there's a fight between the two abstraction mm -hmm. and representation in it, and but abstraction is winning yeah. definitely because it's just punchier, yeah. and the matter lake mark there's a sap green just. You know, snake but it's, or but it's there. funny though, those then the representation of things, only like kind of a few of them in it, but they for me they set off those paintings when you take them out. Like a repair and shadow if you take out the pair. It's just suddenly less interesting. There's not that kind of um, place to jump in. And same with the jug behind us, I think if you just cover it out with your hand, it's suddenly this fight, as you call it, like it isn't there. Like it's it becomes a bit more peaceful where I think when you take those add those things in they just the arduous like bit, and I always quite like a spanner in the work, so I'm kind of not happy if something's all sort of just cosy. It's just not interesting. I think you want a bit of a bit of a struggle. Like I think you know, on a knife's edge is, is where the best place for for painting to be. Do you get to this kind of point? Is it's kind of slow, like when you're painting? 
Because you come to a moment at the end of the day that you're slogging through, mm. and then uh, like the last half an hour of painting just comes alive. Or yeah, no, not it. really. No, it'd be more so kind of um, you know three or four days of, of torture, mm. and then one really really happy day <laughs> where there's just stuff you like five or six paintings sitting around, and then just stuff starts mm. to pull together. So there's this kind of struggle that happens, and then things start to flow and. Generally, though, it is more so just sitting there, scratching your head, you know, just struggling with it, and you know, you get lucky and have one good day. But you know, that's kind of all it takes. So to kind of pull them together, you don't realize they're working. I think maybe up until that point, and sometimes it is like that cliche: it is just that one thing brought in that just sets everything off and pulls it together. What excites you about these? Do you like jump up and down? Remember, um, an artist in NCAD, we were. Um, we were just students and this artist came in and he, uh, he's one of the lecturers and he kind of said the, moment, the reason why he makes art uh, is that he gets this moment so it's just everything clicks and he's, you know, it feels like dancing you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Just every, everything is just ha- you know, and then he moves on to the next yeah, project yeah. and it's this kind of, do you get excited by your work? Oh yeah, there's a high, there's like yeah. a serious high like you come back from the studio thinking you cracked it <laughs> you're just like, but then you, you get these mad highs and you think that like oh, that work is really happening, and you know, you come back in the next day, and you're just like, oh, <laughs> you know, is that it? <laughs> yeah, and there's nothing there, or you know, then there's some days you leave the studio and you're you're you know, frustrated and stuff isn't working, but then you know you come back in and stuff is. So there is absolutely like a addiction to it, like it's you know, it's a safer crack cocaine. It's like, you know, it's a probably waste a bit as much money though. Um, being understood, is there some something we should read here in this work? Or is it just about an experience? I think, yeah, the more emotive and experiential. I mean, I think my main goal was to create kind of these meditative spaces that kind of, you know, speak about kind of connection and relationships between objects and people. So I kind of wanted to create spaces that, that were sort of, um, you know, self-reflexive of myself, but also these meditative spaces that, you know, you can project into. And so it kind of, it was more a feeling than I was after, this kind of a slightly limbotic feeling that, you know, Stuff is trying to take shape or trying to take form, but you know, it isn't quite like it's always again on this knife knife edge. And is, is like I've asked this before of you with like this idea of mood, is this important in the work tone? Yeah, and no, absolutely. I, mean, I think kind of in, you know, if people get your tone and mood is debatable, and yeah. but you know, for me there's definitely a tone and mood that I want to sort of try and achieve with it. So for me, yeah, I think I think so. I kind of, I'm more interested in, in, in that kind of um, that feeling and, and mood than than any kind of um, maybe like higher conceptual sort of underpinning. And, but I think there's also kind of there's gameplay in them as well. There's you know there's trickery kind of with sort of objects. There's a lot of uh, kind of uh, the language of painting them. So there's this kind of duality of, of sort of you know mood and feeling, but then also this. Um, you know, kind of playing around with the actual uh, makeup of painting and the knowledge of painting and kind of how paintings are put together and, you know, putting in shadows and then placing objects in certain places that they push the viewer back or pull them in. So there is always this balance between these two modes of working. But speaking about knowledge um, and painter's knowledge, like, what if someone came up to you and just say the history of painting had been erased, all painting history was gone. And someone came up with three tubes of blue, yellow, and red, mm. and said, "In this era of image making, digital image making, like, what would you think? Like, is that a stupid idea?" Um, it's kind of almost an impossible question to ask. Yeah. There's no frame of reference for it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, yeah. you know, what do you think of this idea of like painting? With, like, it's the most it's the most difficult thing in the world in a way that mm. you're given these three colors. Yeah. Or more beyond that, of course, but just say three colors to make an image. It's always a struggle, there's always an obstacle there mm-hmm. to making the image. And you're always trying to find an image that doesn't exist, so I think it's so yeah, yeah. So, what is it like? What is it about that urge to do that with this kind of stuff? I don't know, I mean, I think it's, it's a weird thing. I think it's actually the, the desire to create. I was reading um, uh, a text by Rose Wiley um, on the train in this morning. and. She was saying that, you know, photography relies on their objects to be there. You know, photography doesn't exist without their, an object in front of it, where painting can exist without that. You can, like, create something that was never there before. So I think that 
for me is, is, is the excitement. I mean, I think that's why I moved away from representational painting and, and from having to have the source material. Because the excitement of, of creating something that wasn't there before just overtook me and this kind of, you know, gameplay and new language. I think I've always, like I've said in a few talks before, that I've always been interested in creating this language that is unique to, to how I work. And, and you, that's kind of, that excites me rather than relying on, you know, found images or, you know, because I, I struggle with that. I kind of, the context of them is, is, is overbearing on me now. But, you know, kind of like scrolling through the internet and just randomly grabbing images, I find them, I just can't do it. Like, you know, and not that I don't think any of it's a valid way to work, but just for me personally, I find it um, difficult to kind of get away from their context where when you're creating your own imagery, you're, it's clearly your own context. It's in you know, everything from your own life or your experiences. So. But I think there's a purity to it for me that is, is kind of exciting. The purity is kind of like, to it's me. It's kind of working in that way that you're kind of, you know, it's in, you know, there's an honesty that I'm striving for in your work that, mm. you know, and I'm trying to get away from kind of too much like baggage. Mm. It's perhaps it's just, impossible. <laughs> but it's, perhaps in the case of all the noise around, the visual noise that we have surrounding us, that mm. there is a purity in this process that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, because it's just, I mean, well, I guess it's, it's I mean, that's, it's, I don't know if there is actually, you know, because I mean, it's, it's informed by, you know, the noise around it. You, yeah. know, you can't get away from that. Like, I mean, I'd be a fool to kind of think that. And so I think, kind of, you know, I think, you know, every artist sets up their little camp and, <laughs> you know, rallies away like and tries to create their own little sort of a unique world and, and maybe that's kind of what it, what the intention is. Is there any doubt in the, any of these, you know, do you, like when does doubt come into these, you know, into your process? You know? every, every morning at about 10 o'clock when I walk into the studio. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course, like, I mean, yeah, there's like so much, there's doubt along the way. I mean, I mean, there's like, there's many levels to it. There's, there's doubt in the creating of the work. You know, is it any good? Is it not? You just don't know. Like, I mean, you're, you're hoping it's good, and then you then you know it's good for a while, and you don't know it's good for a while, and it goes back and forth. And then there's like financial doubt. Then there's you know exhibition doubt. And when you, especially when you come to the end of a show, and you know, there's always these horrible periods that where you nothing on the horizon, and you're just like, you know, you, you kind of go, well, what if I never show again? <laughs> like, what's that? Is like, you know, yeah. am I going to be swept away? And, the tide of, of forgetfulness and you know so yeah it absolutely is and yeah I mean this is a lot. We were talking about this earlier about the audience and making this for an audience and uh, I get the example of every, everything is Henry Miller at the moment so yeah. <laughs> it's not a bad thing. He said um, he was in, a, he, in an interview in the Paris Review like a lot of his books weren't published mm. for 20 years because they were banned and but he kept on writing so he didn't have an audience he was writing his books but they weren't finding a public mm. uh, you know, reader. So this idea of audience is really big to that. You know, yeah. getting an audience for this, getting an audience for the show. Yeah. Um, and there is, a, there is a kind of a push for that all the time, all the yeah. time. And then when you don't get an audience, you think there's some kind of failure mm. on your part or your work. Yeah. Yeah. So like, can you make work without that audience uh, or that kind of dreamed audience? Uh, like, I, I, I couldn't, you know, I think there has to be, you know, like I wouldn't intentionally make the work for a specific audience, but you do want there to be an audience that comes to the work. For me, the work doesn't exist otherwise. I mean, if it's not being experienced, well then it's just, you know, me and my works and, you know, that's kind of, I don't get that. I'm, I, don't, I mean, I've never understood why some of them make it. What about so those artists that come out 30 or 40 years later? Because yeah. this is like recently in the LA Times, this guy, uh, John McLaughlin, mm. and he, he wasn't, he wasn't noticed at all uh, at the time. But now all of a sudden he is, he's dead now, you know. But, but I, I, I kind of admire that, like, yeah. that someone could be making these works in that pure sense mm -hmm. and, and not caring about it. It's amazing, like, mm -hmm. it's really... Uh, and I have an Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, not, yeah. not having Facebook, not having this kind of other audience. Like, not having that like, constant thing, that yeah. constant, constant lump in your brain, <laughs> burning away. Yeah. But um, no, I, I kind of I admire that. I think it'd be amazing if you, if you could. But I just, um, for me, like I don't know if it's, a, it's a, an extrovert part of my personality or what, but there is this desire to, you know, show the work. Like, you know, it, it excites me getting the work up there and, and having it out there and that chance to kind of communicate with people in, in a different way. And I think that's for me, the root of it is this 
idea of being able to communicate in a way that I can't verbally do or in written word. And you, it, it's that kind of an, again that duality where someone asks you to explain your work. But you're just like, well, the work's doing explaining itself. That's that's why it's there. Like I mean, for me to start, you know, getting into the nitty gritty of it, I always just think it sucks the magic out of it. Like you know, it's just you, know, you just watch people's faces drop and you, <laughs> you say kind of what something is. And they're like, you hear that sound? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the magic's just gone. And you're like, oh. So sometimes, I think with this work as well, I, I found it even trickier to talk about individual works. You know, I can talk about mood or intent, but to actually get to the bones of works has been so much trickier than any other show. And I, and I think it is for me because trying to communicate other stuff there that I can't quite verbally get out. So, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting dilemma. <coughs> what about, this is an absurd question, what about, like, are you, have you hope for the future of painting? Yeah, no, there is. I think you know, painting's in a good place. You know, yeah. I think in Ireland as well. Like, I'm just talking to a curator the other day, and, and you know, and I was like, I think it's something that another artist friend of mine as well said. So like, Ireland's like this Galapagos island of of, of of art. <laughs> so there's like a lot of different practices, and even within painting, it's quite diverse. Like, you know, if you were to grab like a group of 20 painters from the same age, you know, roughly the same age bracket, like just, just kind of, I don't really see a huge connection between them, which, which excites me, I think yeah. it's really, really good, like it's just, you know, when you go to London, there's such schools of painting, like it's kind of like, you have to have this slight Edwardian drawing in your work at the moment, and it's just kind of, or you know, I remember like five years ago, it was triangles, like you had to have tons of triangles and hexagons, and that was it, and if you've done anything else, you're out. And I find that like, you know, mind boggling it's just like, why would you do that? You know, it's what I quite like about Ireland. I don't know, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's kind of weird and, and nice. Any questions? Does anyone want to put in? Because uh, we're not going to cover everything here, definitely not. No. So uh, We've been talking for a good yeah. 15 minutes now. So. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, um, uh, it's kind of a long spiel, but you know, there's, <laughs> there's certain things, there's, um, there's still life elements and there's you in the space kind of making these you know abstract gestures mm -hmm. and stuff and like I was thinking about painters like Mirandi who had this very you know had this very kind of anonymous relationship with the with the work their whole life and I just seen in the statement that was you referenced some you know some family things mm -hmm. and things like that referenced in the titles and not every painter does that some painters kind of erase that yeah that kind of practice, that life of painting. Mm. Are you aware of it? I, a I, I think it's a really interesting question because um, for me what I found is as I drift away from this um, college learning, you kind of let me know, it's taken an awfully long time, and like, um, but like my filter has kind of uh, weakened. So there isn't this complete divide anymore. I find it so hard to keep you know, my, my personal life and everything out, out, out from my work and, and the more I kind of want the work to express a certain mood, I can't justify keeping it out. And I remember when I was, you know, like writing the statement, I was like, I felt really uncomfortable about it. Like, and I still do a bit speaking about it, but it is the, it's the honesty of the work. I can't not. I mean, it is, it is what, what drove it. Like, you know, um, a lot of the psychological elements in these paintings come from kind of doing like five months of grief counselling, which is like the strangest thing I've ever done, which is a, and like a, a real privilege to, to kind of sit down and just talk to someone about stuff as you know, it shouldn't be undervalued, like it's an amazing thing, so, and that was such a, an impact on my life to not be able, you know, for that not to be in my work, I think is impossible, it's just, that, you know, like painting is such a, an intimate medium to use, like the tones, everything about it, you're mixing the colours, it's only you and your canvas, so, you know, I, I can't separate the, you know, my life from my work anymore because it's just going to make the work clinical and uninteresting. You know, it's um, I think I'm kind of too, too self-obsessed or something. I don't know. It's a, you know, it's a strange thing. Like it's, it's what fuels the work at the moment. So you know, again, this could change. Something could take my fancy. You know, three years from now, and I'll be off kind of making work about cows or something. Who knows? But you know, but at the moment, yeah, it's just this filter seems to be kind of corroded away and then um, it feels right to kind of be um, exploring these things and, and kind of letting them out. And I think that's always been there in my work, but I've maybe hidden it more or found a different way to speak about it. And I've just gotten fed up with the art speak at the moment. I'm just like, I just wouldn't mind using a few nice words. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I was kind of, you're 100% right. When I read that, because um, I know Damien for years, and um, when I read your press release, I was quite kind of, oh, <laughs> like, should you sh show that or share that yeah. or talk about that? You know, but we don't deny them. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do it. Like, art is such it, a weird place. But it was so, good to do that, yeah, like, because it kind of, like, art, the distrib distrib dis distribution of art mm -hmm. and the way we talk about it, art is very conservative. And if anyone does anything a little bit out of the yeah. norm, it seems, oh, can you do that? Mm -hmm. But also, art is a self portrait. So, you right. know what I mean? Like, like you know, anybody mm -hmm. denies that, I think, is a bit mad. Like, cause mm -hmm. it's like it's you making the work. So, it's a reflection of you somehow. You know? Yeah, it is. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, not that like it's like some unveiling of yourself, but there's definitely you in there. So, and, and you know, and, and, and are you just like certain degrees of that, you know, of the personality are, are in there. And, and I guess it depends how far you go down that rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. You know, I slipped and fell all the way down. So, it's just like, oh. But this, yeah. this work out for me anyway, personally, it's, it's a kind of celebration of painting. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that work there, I just kind of was, when I came across that piece there, I was kind of like, oh, this is just about material, mm -hmm. it's about paint, it's about scrubbing away, it's about adding to, subtracting. Yeah. And it's quite visceral in mm -hmm. a way, and it's quite uplifting. So, you know, there's something optimistic about this show. But I, but I think, but that's, I mean, yeah, that's funny, because someone else said it to me, and I was like, I don't know why you would think it would be otherwise, mm. because painting for me has always been, like, not to be a complete cliche, but it's always been my go-to place. Mm. Like, you know, I, I started painting very young, and it would be this thing that when something was going wrong, that's where I'd go. You know, just go to my room and paint, you know, and turn up to music, and just, you know, you drift off into these worlds, so. I think it's like, um, you know, one of my tutors said that, you know, everything goes 360 in your, in your art practice. And you just start off at one point, travel all the way around and go through all these different places and end it back at the beginning again. And I kind of have, like, I'm, you know, 14 again in, in my studio, like this in the heavy metal painting. I was just like, yeah, that's yeah, pretty much what I was doing then. Is what I'm doing now. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, it is a comfortable thing. And it's a, it's a celebration to kind of, you know, be able to do that. And, you know, I don't want to say privilege because I hate that word, but, you know, it's a nice place to be. Any questions? Any more? Anybody? Can you ask anything? It's a safe, it's a safe place. <laughs> it's like you're in a safe place. Um, you talk about the uh, reduction of language. Mm -hmm. I think so. I ain't kind of um, having an increase in scale gave that you know opportunity to have these more concentrated little moments. Because you know if it was on a smaller canvas, you know those concentrated little moments would have to be you know microscopic, if you know what I mean. So there is that thing. I think the scale, you know, gave that freedom, and, and it's taken a, a good few years to kind of get to that place. I remember when I used to make larger works, they would be really heavily overworked, and there'd be this, you know feeling of having to kind of get into each crevice and have it all balanced and I think kind of, you know, having a few breakthroughs over here with larger works where there was this kind of confidence to, you know, transfer like the, the similar language of smaller works to larger works because it is really difficult because, you know, somebody would say is that even when you're working on larger works like the, the wrist becomes the elbow, becomes the shoulder so it becomes more difficult to translate it, but, um, but I think definitely with this work, having that larger scale, give that kind of freedom to, to kind of focus in on, on smaller areas. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, but I think that, you know, that's what I was, I was hoping to kind of get with, you know, this, this more sort of meditative space that you get to kind of travel around it rather than be confronted. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, like for me, like I'm kind of I'm obsessed with balance, like you know how things balance off each other. So um, you know, with a larger scale, there was that real like entertainment almost, you know, to to balance stuff over larger distances and to see how you can tilt stuff off or how you can put something in to activate. Um, and you know, the kind of more um, real sort of things were kind of brought in towards towards the end just to throw a spanner into works and you know do something that 
maybe wouldn't be expected um, in these works. And again, with, with the larger scale, you've kind of got that freedom to put something in. Yeah, but, you know, I wouldn't that. It's just, um, for somebody else who talked last year, somehow said something interesting about her shortcomings, maybe, and her ability to paint descriptively. Mm. And it's really me. I just, you know, if you, if you paint a branch with leaves on it, mm -hmm. and, okay, it's kind of an abstract idea about it as well, so maybe it's safe within that territory. Yeah. But it, you can sort of take it apart as well. How is it painted? Mm. Is, it a, is it a good version of a leaf? Yeah, yeah. You know, like, you know what I mean? It's, yeah, no, I mean, I've put it. You could enjoy the balance between yeah. the things, but you could actually go up and look at even the abstract shapes. Mm. How I, mean, I would feel very self-conscious of, of how latent they are. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I mean, my only concern is how far I render them. Like, because I would have studied, like, you know, in traditional painting, you know, and I, I kind of, I can do kind of Baroque Renaissance type paintings. So, like, my, my question for me when I was working them was, like, how far do I bring them? Yeah. You know, how, what, what level of realism do I give it? And I remember even with the pair, it was kind of this tentative thing of, like, a little bit more, a little bit more, and then we, you know, and, you know, there's that kind of fear of going too far, and, and then I think we're going to have that problem of a collage feeling, or as you're saying, that you get obsessed with how it's rendered. So um, for me, it was just how far do you bring it before it tips over and becomes, you know, a problem rather than a solution. <laughs> you know, you're yourself into that state where, you know, the subconscious starts to take over or, you know, the you know, intuition starts to take over and you try not to overthink it because the second you overthink it, it's gone. And it's like someone was asking me, is there any drawings done for any of these? And I was like, absolutely not, because when you're drawing something, you know, when you're working from a drawing, you're doing this, like, you know. You know, and, and then there's so many problems and, you know, you're never going to get scale, right? <laughs> like, it's going to be completely wrong. So for me, there is that, you know, element of chance and, and kind of then... Um, so yeah. has your work been completely impossible? Um, no, no, I don't think so, no. But if you've been led by the intuition of the marks and the space that's been created... Well, I think it's, it's, so but I think it's re reading into the, and kind of that balance between putting down a mark and reading it and bringing it somewhere else, like, so they're not... The I don't think... Is creating an image. Um, I don't know. I'd have, a, I'd have an issue with that idea that they're just process. I don't think so. No, the process being the intuition and the way you're making it and the materials to push themselves to, yeah. to reveal their image. Okay, yeah, yeah, no, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of I'm not too sure. It's quite true when you do it, you don't have it in Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I think as well, like, I mean, I, I think it's because what we were talking about before, you know, this talk was that, that I think is all where. There's been kind of a building up of language over a certain amount of years, so the idea that they're, um, they're completely from thin air is, 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 not, is not, 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 not a reality like at all. So, so that's why I'd be kind of like, you know, I'd struggle with it just, you know, like that. It's also the understanding of that time that's spent learning how to use Yeah. Well, you know, only allows this level of certainty. Yeah, and, but it, I think that, you know, this, this idea of certainty is kind of a little bit of a. Uh, you know, but a, a, a bit of a, a sham because, like, you know, I've, I've done so many paintings that, you know, there is a level of, of knowing, you know, uh, that there's a, I never say 100% chance, but there's, you know, a 70% chance that something's going to work out if you put it there. 
So there's a building up of language that, um, yeah, there's an intent to it, and then there's, you know, then there's a level of chance, and so there's this balancing act between Do, the I think, like, there's something interesting about what you're talking about there, and that I think all the marks are in your head already. Mm. I think they are, and I think, but what I was talking about earlier about these, that contexts make painters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In that, you know, just say you go for a job, okay, and you don't get the job. And then your and your world, world kind of falls apart, and then you become a little bit freer. In the context, mm. you know, or if you, if you have a job and it conditions what you do, you're not as free as you were. Yeah, so the context shapes your freedom. So a lot of people think they're free yeah. to do the marks that they're doing on the canvas, but they're not. They're not really free. Yeah. It, the context shapes freedom yeah. in, in a way. I think really that'd be also true when you're asking about the studios. You know, the, the, the context of like Temple Bar like, just didn't work for yeah, me. That's it, it kind of was this constraining thing where I went to Broadstone and it was just a bit more, a bit more rock and roll there, so it kind of freed up this kind of element yeah. of your, maybe away from this epicenter, which is yeah. kind of nice. And, yeah. So shaking your, pra shaking your painting you know, or your context maybe a, a kind of cure for, you know, doing what, what's really there, all the marks that are already there in your head. But it's also, I think, about reinventing them for yourself and, and mm. making them exciting because there is that kind of um, sense of boredom when you kind of, like, when I'm, if I'm repeating myself, I kind of get very stagnant about it and kind of it drags me down. And, you know, in saying that, though, I think my work has leveled out a bit now over the last kind of couple of years. It, it's not shifting as dramatically as before. So I think there is a bit more of a an area of interest that's growing that I'm kind of becoming more interested in that's kind of holding my attention rather than... Well, can a response change? Like, just say you get a really great response from the show. Um, <coughs> you get reviews in art form mm. or whatever it is, okay? Does that change then how you continue in the future? Does that kind of uh, prescribe, like, oh, that mark worked, I'm going to go with that, that painting worked? I'm more blue go. paintings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, d I honestly don't know. Um, I hope not, but... I've always, I, like, you know, the kind of coming out of college in, in 2008 when the crash hit was a blessing in a way. Because before that, I think, you know, you need a much higher chance of having a sellout show. You know, like, when I had my first sellout show, there was no money at all around, so there's no real chance of having a big sellout show. And, and that was a frustration, but also a freedom, because you didn't have that. And, oh, you've got to make a, a good selling show. It was actually just like, yeah. <laughs> so it's a nice place to show in. We're gonna we're gonna go for maybe more critical response than, and uh, you know a, a sales response. So I've kind of built my practice through that way, and and, and it's kind of it's stuck with me. Like even when dealing with you know other galleries like abroad, and you know there's kind of maybe more of a, a professional element to them. I still feel like a bit of a you know a rough, <laughs> rough and ready artist coming along because you you can't you can't let go of that. And, idea you have for your work so um, which kind of can become great and when you know you've got someone there uh, wanting to do something with your work and you're just like no so i don't know if i don't know if that would happen and i i, I honestly can't say and you know the response to the work has been has been really good for this show and especially overseas but how that informs what happens next is, is really tough to say and you know we'll see any question? Question from David. Is there, is there a lot of love in the paintings? <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> there are often, well, often five topics. We talk about the love of Maxine and your My love. Or your question. But there are other people, there are other, you know, it's, there are kind of relationships and there mm. are, uh, I mean, I think the tension that's found in some of the paintings comes from, you know, some, not some of the person, but it's, you know, it's it's a uh, it, it, piece called family, mm -hmm. piece called party. Um, you know, I'm looking at the piece here at the centre of the wall, the match burning at the wrong end, the flame somewhere else. It, it, you know, it's, it, and a lot of things in the work suggest you know two yeah, but tension it's, between two people or two. Well, people. I think there's always um, there's always that kind of juxtaposition in my work in, and in my thinking. Like I'm, I've always got these two polar things yeah. bashing away at each other. And a lot of the times, like I mean, with this work, it, it is about that connection in in life, and, and kind of over the last kind of two years, having this very very disconnected feeling to reality, and, and that kind of um, yeah, perplexing thing of you know 
what does anything mean? Like, you know, these yeah. like horribly grand, you know, yeah. grand questions that we like to put in little boxes and put under the bed yeah. because, you know, you think about them too long and, you know, you go insane. So, but, you know, it is about that connectivity and that, and that reconnection and to life and, and trying to kind of, um, yeah, understand just the little things again, you know, and which, you know, are kind of important, but, you know, it's amazing how far you can drift out without realizing. And, you know, you, you can become quite isolated as well, you know, especially, you know, at that time as well, moving my studio and then moving further out into the country, it was kind of this grander disconnection to what was going on. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's finding that balance. And again, with the work, there's all this balance going on. So. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people who work more empty out from the moment to Saturday and there's a lot of cool empty space or space for the viewer needs more space for you to get at the work. But I feel there's also a lot of emotion, a lot of there's a strong mm. kind of emotional current flowing through the show that maybe wouldn't have been maybe as, as for me as any before. Yeah, no, no, I, no, a few people have said that and you know I'd agree with them, you know, absolutely. And um, you know, I, I think before I think that's you know what I was saying to, to Kevin there was I, you know I would just you know stuff would be maybe hidden with a veneer of, of, of an idea, you know, so yeah. it might be underlying somewhere in there, but it was, um, I remember as another uh, painter said to me, like, you know, it was, uh, before there was maybe more more cleverness and less bronze, yeah. and maybe it's a bit more balanced uh, in this show, so. Is there any more questions? Yeah, there's one here. Yeah, that's a